Happy New Year, Screen Junkies! It is so good I'm to see you. I'm on television too. You're on the television <laughs> yeah, too. I didn't realize that. Our that's monitor me. is up. Yeah. That's you. We are so this excited to be back today. I'm Roth Cornight here with Mr. Dan Merle, and Hello. we are delighted to welcome writer, director, producer, actor, lover. horror <laughs> lover of horror, and all things spiders. We have just discovered, mm -hmm. Mr. Lee Winnell. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. We Thank are here. You, you can Thank see you. yourself on our monitor, I know. like wow, you just it's said. Really is that, disconcerting. Is it way. distracting? <laughs> well, it's sort of slightly out of sync. So I feel like I'm living in a David Lynch movie right now, <laughs> where everything's a little off. Yeah. I literally always feel like I'm living in a David Lynch movie. Yeah. I have David Lynch earrings. Have you seen The Art of Life? The The Art Life. The David Art Lynch, Life. The Art I did Life. watch that documentary. Did you enjoy it? I did. Very much so. Uh, I'm a big David Lynch fan. In fact, I think he's one of the greatest horror directors out there, even though we don't usually call him a horror director. He's sort of in his own little David Lynch genre, but his stuff is so scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mulholland Drive- it Scared the crap out of me. Scarier movie. than, you know, 90% of the horror films out there. So um, I loved that documentary, getting a little insight into his creative process. Yeah, it was pretty fascinating, but we're not here to talk about David Lynch's no. documentary. Why talk about here. someone great when you can talk about me? <laughs> we are here to talk about your film coming out this Friday, January 5th, Insidious, yes. The Last Key. Of mm -hmm. course, everybody will know you from Insidious and Saw and all of the other things. I guess, I guess mainly Insidious and Saw. Yeah, I, yeah mean, I mean, a lot really. of not many people come up to me and say, you know, I loved the mule. <laughs> <laughs> Besides relatives of mine, if someone does, do you like them a little bit more? They do vault up. It's like, oh, you're going deep cuts. Yeah, <laughs> you know, this is not in introductory course. This is Lee Winnell deep cuts. Um, yeah, the mule. I mean, that was never. It's 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 interesting. You go into certain films knowing already that they're not going to be they're not going to light the box office on fire. I mean, and the Mule is an Australian crime thriller about a a guy who uh, swallows a bunch of heroin to smuggle drugs and is then caught at the airport. And so his solution to the problem is to not go to the toilet so that like you know he won't pass the evidence so already going in i'm like this is not this doesn't have four <laughs> quadrant appeal this is not something that uh you know grandma's going to be taking the the grandkids to um so yeah if someone mentions it i know they've gone they've gone deep it's a deep cut it's pretty cool grandma that is bringing the grandkids to the last key though because we were just saying and i'm i'm gonna say this and it's with extreme love um last night we saw your film and mr dan merle was next to myself um and and my partner and he then described the way that dan watched the movie as again this is said with love as the stephen hawking because dan was doing this the whole time which is a huge compliment to you yeah yeah uh, well i, I it is. Horror films are interesting in that if somebody comes up to you and says, uh, I saw your movie, couldn't finish it, instead of being offended, <laughs> you're like, thank you very much. That's uh, great. That we, did our, we did our job. I get that a lot. I get, uh, I couldn't finish it. I, I only saw a third of it because um, I was, you know, holding my sleeve over my eyes. Um, uh, you know, I wanted to be sick. I had to leave. All this stuff, they ca all this sort of stuff counts as a compliment in the horror world. I'm not a natural horror viewer personally. I I, I would see a, a few of them, but I have to give credit to my girlfriend Mara. She's a huge horror fan. So in mm -hmm. the last couple of years, you know, I have been inducted into that world now. So like she showed <laughs> me the first three Insidious movies, and then you know the the lot of the, I'd seen the first Saw movie, but she showed me the Saw movies, and we're catching up on all these franchises. So I actually came into this knowing the lore, which actually was beneficial because I think it helps with this one. Right. But also like I'm still learning how to watch a horror movie because I, I don't I enjoy the movies, but I don't particularly enjoy uh, watching them because I'm very I'm very skittish and uh, and and things jumping out at me are very I get very nervous. It's a very nervous experience. But, but I think that's why people watch them. Right. I mean, well, is it because it's not just a passive viewing experience? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, the media landscape these days, people are going to the movies less and less. People have, you know, televisions in their homes that are as, uh, you know, the picture quality is, is is great. It's not like when I was growing up and the picture quality on with my home television was terrible. Going to the movies was an improvement. Now you have all these like HD 4K screens and you have gaming. There's, there's less reasons to leave the house and go drive to a movie theater and, 
pay the ticket price. And so I, th I think horror films are one of the last genres left that actually drag people mm. off the couch and into movie theaters because I, 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 my guess is that audiences want to have that communal horror film experience where you're sitting in a room with hundreds of strangers and you're all screaming together. It's kind of a, a, a theme park experience as opposed to watching it by yourself at home. In a way, that's kind of scarier because you're alone in a house. I have really creeped myself out watching horror films late at night at home alone. Mm. But when I'm sitting in a theatre surrounded by people, it never gets to that point. There's a there's a safety in being surrounded by your fellow human beings. And I, I think that's why people still like seeing it in theatres. I made the mistake of watching The Babadook at home uh, alone mm -hmm. late at night, and that's a mistake that I'll never repeat. That's more of a thriller, psychological Not thriller. Not to me. For me. <laughs> really? I don't know. How, do people, yeah. how do people make up yeah. these labels, though? Like, how do you decide what's a psychological thriller and I, what's not? I think it's a horror movie. It's a horror movie, but the only reason is because The Babadook... I, I feel like, well, I can't say, because then it would be a spoiler for anybody... Well, I think that didn't. Well, spoiler alert: I slept with the lights on for three <laughs> nights, so it was the only psychological thriller that made me sleep. I with slept the with a bat after the ring. Oh, after the American remake of the ring. Correct. You, uh, you saw it in theaters and then went home and I, slept with a baseball bat. I, I slept with a baseball bat, which hmm. was pointless because I had this argument with my with my roommate at the time, who was saying like, ah, I was really really terrified, and then this she said sleep with a bat, and I was like, she's made. Television. What is a bat going to do? <laughs> that's true. You know? She's made of television. <laughs> She's made of television. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I mean, I guess that's what horror films are aiming to do. They're aiming to make you want to sleep with the bat. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's again, it's a curious film genre because um, you're kind of aiming to upset and disturb people, and people don't like being upset and disturbed um, for the most part. So I, I do, I do find that that's a curious, uh, relationship that horror films have with their audience. It's a, it's an attraction repulsion, but it's a controlled yeah. upset. Maybe that's why. Exactly. I mean, I think human, the world is a scary place, mm. yeah, especially today. Um, and I think that no, no human being wants to be walking down the street and suddenly realize they're being followed or, um, suddenly have someone in their face with a knife or a gun or, or, you know, that sort of real life fear is unpleasant and traumatic. Whereas a movie, it, as you said, it's kind of a controlled version of that. You get to watch someone else get followed down the street mm -hmm. by, a, by a person and you, you sort of get, you dip your toes in the waters of what that would feel like. But, but then all of a sudden the movie's over and you're back to your safe little, you know, regular life. And, I think human beings, I mean, why do human beings want to get on roller coasters? Like that to me, when you tell me you don't like watching horror movies, I'm thinking, why? What, what's scary about it? And then I remember that I can't get on a roller coaster. <laughs> my, my, my daughter, who's five, can get on a roller coaster and I have to sit at the bottom and watch her. I just have this fear of that. I don't like it at all. And people make fun of me for it. And so I guess my fear of roller coasters is the same as your well, it's, it's fear it's, of horror movies. It's, it's the it's, fear of the unknown. It's the fear of like something is going to happen and you don't know exactly what and it's going to scare you and it's going to terrify you. And in retrospect, you know, you walk out of it and you go like, oh, I had a really good time. But in the moment, you're like, I, I, this it's, is it's, it's, it's the yeah, fight or flight me, response. To you know? me, you're the irrational one because a movie <laughs> is, it's not, it's just happening on a screen. It's not really happening. Whereas a roller coaster is actually plummeting down at, at high speeds and could fly off the rail and it like. probably won't. It could, but it probably won't. So, are you, are you guys fans of, of roller coasters and, and scary rides? I am. You, I, you, I you're do a Six Flags. See, yeah. to me, that doesn't make. I'm doesn't, also yeah. I'm also deathly terrified of ghosts, just like in real life, which I will 100% grant you is irrational, and yet I still fear them very yeah. much. So, so you you guys think I'm weird for being terrified of Six Flags, and, and I think you're weird for being terrified of the ring which um, I would gladly watch at 3 a.m. and just be like, what a great film. Did it not scare you at all? It did scare me, but it doesn't, I, again, yeah, I Six Flags 
It scares you yeah. more. I, uh, that is a far more rational fear. That that is the more rational fear. However, I will say I will say this with the ring because I had grown up a huge horror fan, um, and I didn't understand why it affected me that much. Mm-hmm. So I bought it, and then I bought Ringo, and I bought every uh, sequel of the Japanese series, and I watched it again and again and again until I could figure out why it was scaring me so much. And this was it. I had grown up with Friday the Thirteenth, and I had grown up with um, Nightmare on Elm Street, and I had grown up with rules. And it told me that the universe had order and that if you followed the correct rules Mm -hmm. and the order, you could win. And the ring said, nope, you can't. The only way to survive this is to be a bastard and force it on someone else and give someone else the Mm -hmm. tape. And the the rules are there are no rules and the universe is chaos and it doesn't like you. Right. Okay. (laughs) Now that's That's scary. It's a logical explanation. (laughs) I mean, that sort of stuff. If I'm watching a film that is, um, you know, designed to be a scary film, whether it's Poltergeist or The Exorcist or whatever it is, I'm kind of, I might be scared and I might be getting jolts, but I'm having fun. The the films that sort of stay with me in a really disturbing way, my version of sleeping with the bat in the bed is something like Under the Skin. Mm. There's, there's a scene in Under the Skin when, spoiler alert, when she leaves a, a baby on the beach without, I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen Under the Skin, but, um, uh, Scarlett Johansson plays this alien yeah. who's visiting Earth and she just has this total lack of empathy for human beings. To her, they're like animals. Yeah. They're like cattle. Not and even. So this crying baby on the beach, she has no empathy for it and just leaves it. That stayed with me for weeks. Like that got under my skin, pardon the pun, to such a large degree that I almost wish I hadn't seen the film, you know, because I have children myself. And so I, I, I was like, that... That is my version of, of of the horror film that you wish you hadn't. That you need to take a bath after you yeah. after right. you watch it to try well, and get it off you. I'm curious because when you're writing a movie like Insidious, you're writing a movie like you know the, the one of the, the few saw movie, first few saw movies. When you're when you're kind of putting yourself in that thing of like I'm writing something that's intended to scare people. Mm-hmm. How much of it is in your head like this is what scares me this is what things like that scene from under the skin and how much of it are you keeping in mind like oh the audience is really going to respond to this or you know how much of it is playing on your own fears you, versus kind of the kind audience of fear? i think you, uh, well i think you have to use yourself as the as a barometer i mean um i write films alone you know writing a feature film is kind of a lonely occupation you it's just you you're kind of in this bubble you're writing a film and so you really only have yourself to gauge so yeah the question i always ask is is this scary to me Mm -hmm. and then i hope that if it scares me it'll scare someone else but then by the time you get to it it isn't scary for you anymore obviously like when you're once you've seen it but you have to remember that initial feeling you had when you were writing it like okay um, I, I I know that when I first had this idea, I thought it was scary. You, you just kind of have to hang on to that. Yeah. My trick, if you guys want to know a trick, if you get really scared in a horror movie, this mm-hmm. is what I do. I pull myself back from the camera and I picture a grip scratching their ass. <laughs> that, that, will, that will make you feel better. It, right there is a, it is a lot, a lot of people, it's strange, I get this question a lot, which I always find quite odd. Um, um, journalists, reporters, or whoever would be talking. In my case, mostly bloggers. We're not really talking journalists here. These no, are not the people who cracked not. Watergate where I'd open. <laughs> but they're usually like, <laughs> I, I get this question a lot. Um, so was it scary on set? And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm always polite when I answer that question, but I'm always thinking, have you ever been on a film set? <laughs> there are hundreds of burly men standing around. There are, there are. It is so noisy. It's the least scary. Um, I, 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 yeah, I find that confusing. That somehow people think the set of a horror film would be scary. It takes the same amount of people to make a horror film as it does any, any other, other film. Yeah. It's not a quiet, like. But yes, I think people conflate the content of the movie with. The, the, the making of the film. It's confusing. Getting yourself scared would be the, yeah. the bigger challenge in that as an actor. Yeah, maybe. You know? Yeah. But even then, as you said, yeah. just in your peripheral vision is a grip <laughs> scratching his ass. Exactly. <laughs> this guy, he just won't stop scratching his ass. Um, we're, 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 we want to get a cream for him eventually. You know, we have to. Yeah. We have to. It's a skin cream. You know? it's, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's nothing that we can't talk about on air. Something I think that is in common with both of the kind of franchises that you started was that they 
from movie to movie they kind of develop you know saw the antagonist mm-hmm. develops mm-hmm. and then with this one you know the first two insidious movies were very much centered on the family right and then the last two have been you take lynn shay's character mm-hmm. elise and kind of now mm-hmm. she's driving that franchise was there a point was it just kind of the first two movies you thought you you told that story wanted to kind of shift to that character or was there something about lynn shay that you're like i think she could really lead because you don't see that very often and, and i think that's one of the things that keeps horror movies fresh is when they keep it different kind of an older woman being the lead central character mm-hmm. of a horror franchise was there something in those first two movies where you said like i think i can write movies about this character once i've told this story absolutely i mean lynn's such a great character actor you know she's been acting for a long time um and she's kind of beloved she's kind of a, a cult figure lynn she still gets recognized to this day for her roles in uh there's something about mary and mm-hmm. kingpin yeah. You know, she's, which is funny, when you go to Lynn's house, she actually has the, the boobs from There's Something About Mary on the wall, the really tanned <laughs> boobs. But she's she's such a firecracker of a human being when you meet her. She's got so much energy. I mean, she's got the energy of a, of a 15-year-old. And she's just raring to go, and she's really emotional and, 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 and such a great collaborator that in working with her on those first two Insidious films, I absolutely knew that she would be a great focal point for the movies going forward. And and the audience responded. I I I, I see the reaction. You know, we've we've been around the world um, with these movies and with audiences from um, all different countries and cultures, and people just react really well to Lynn. Um, the kids, the kids, the kids love her. They, there's something, maybe, I don't know what it, you know, what it is about Lynn, but um, they really react well to her. She's, um, I, I, I interviewed her after the first Insidious and mm-hmm. there was this incredible, there's certain people that just have this incredible warmth um, mm-hmm. and she does. And I feel like it just comes, um, it comes off the screen as well. And so you feel like you're in safe hands as you're being guided through the further, guided through these worlds. Even though it's terrifying, you trust in this character because you trust Lynn yeah. to some degree. And I'm wondering, um, do you foresee it's possible, she's such the fulcrum of this franchise now, can it go forward ever without her? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I'm the last person to ask because I... I um I really don't plan ahead (laughs) with anything really in life, but especially with these films, I'm not thinking three chess moves down the road. Like when you had Jason Blum on your show, that would have been a good time because I think his business is to think three moves ahead and where could the series go? I really don't know. I mean, um, I just, I know I had fun doing this last film with Lynn and I know she loves playing the character. Um, So yeah, we'll see. Say. So when you do like, because the, the, the last two Insidious films have both had these kind of little nods toward uh, mm-hmm. the first two. And in a way that having seen them all, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool how they, you know, kind of right. did these things that like, oh, that makes sense. Like, is that are you just kind of reverse engineering that where you're like, yes. this is an opportunity where I think I could put in a thing that ties into the because they don't because sometimes it feels cheap, like, oh, mm-hmm. they're just doing that. But I, I these do feel like. Oh, okay. So mm-hmm. this piece kind of, even if it's small, fits into the puzzle, this larger right. puzzles. It's just kind of just looking at it and saying, like, I could put in something here. It really is reverse engineered. I mean, uh, when James Wan and I did that first Insidious film, we weren't thinking about a sequel at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, that's something you get a lot in interviews is like, um, so did you have the sequels in mind? And maybe some people do. I remember reading an interview with George Lucas years ago where he mm. said, I always had a plan for that type of thinking is so alien to me. I only ever focus on the film that's right in front of me because it's hard enough to get that right. It's hard enough to get one film right, let alone start thinking about two other films down the line. So, yeah, all of it is just reverse engineered. And and the sleight of hand that you have to pull off is that you have to make it look like it was intended so that people think, oh, this was a plan all along. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this. Now I'm revealing the trick. (laughs) I should have said, yeah, it was all totally planned. Intricate plan. An intricate plan. I was following a whiteboard with, you know, those schematics that, um, unhinged cops always do in yes, serial killer. The murder like, board. The murder board. It's yes. always like disparate photos with lines, <laughs> and it's like if I could just, yeah, I should pretend that I have one of those, but it's really, it's all just haphazard and um, sleight of hand. It's what comic books do all the time with a retcon. Uh, I'm curious, you know, Jigsaw is now pretty, like, kind of an iconic 
villain. He's kind of the Freddy of this of, of this new century we're yeah. living in. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, he really is. And so, I'm curious if you have favorite horror villains of all time and what you think the key is to making one that really lasts and leaves that impression. Oh man, I mean, it, I almost feel like different versions of me have to answer this question because it's like, it's like, you know, um, 25 year old film student me would say that my ha favorite horror villains were, um, you know, Bob from Twin Peaks and Jack Torrance from The Shining. Okay, mm -hmm. but yes. Yes, like one of the greatest. <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, uh, current me would probably just rattle off a list of my favorite horror films. It's like if you ask someone, um, what, what are your favorite band names? They'll just tell you their favorite bands. You know, the name becomes, so if you ask me for my favorite horror villains, I'm just gonna give you a list of my favorite horror movies and the, and the villains in them. But 15 year old me, if he, we're really doing some time traveling here. If 15 year old me was sitting here answering these questions, I would probably say, um, People like Freddy and Michael Myers. I mean, those those villains. That usually, what happens is with those long-running horror franchises that started in the late seventies and the eighties, like Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth. Usually, what happens is the first one is a classic that is still fondly regarded, and then the law of diminishing returns comes into play. And by the time they get up to part seven, part eight, part nine, it's not as good, and you've got this diehard group of fans that still love them, but but can begrudgingly admit that um, they're not great movies anymore like the original, but there's still a perverse pleasure you get from seeing Friday the 13th part eight. Um, so I, th I, th I think there is, for me, there is a real um, kind of a humbling um, joy in knowing that, f that Jigsaw is kind of means to a lot of kids today what Freddie meant to me when I was 14 and 15 years old. You know, like that, there's something cool about that. Like we, uh, again, I have to include James Wan in this. James Wan and I, when we created the first Saw movie, we never intended it to be, to be sequelized. We never had a plan that that would, that is a ridiculous notion that we would be sitting there going, can't wait to do part three of this. <laughs> We, were, we didn't even think the first one would happen. We, we, and, and so to look back now and see all these movies and see Jigsaw become an iconic villain is really, um, it's kind of cool, you know? Like, um, it's, 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 it's good, it's great. <laughs> is there anything that you can see that, cause you can sort of see what Michael Myers and, um, and Jason certainly have in common. Besides the masks, there are these relentless forces, mm -hmm. right, of nature. Um, Freddy as well in a much more comical eventually way. Mm -hmm. But is there something about Jigsaw that you can see that just sort of caught the... Well, I guess in hindsight, it's easier to do this, isn't it? Like to do the autopsy years later. And, and, and um, I think looking back, if I had to dissect it, I would say that there was something about the game element that, that stuck with people. And if you think about human beings, we, we love to do that, uh, you know, would you rather, you know, cut off your leg or your arm, you know, yeah. these, these would you rather games. And there was something about the game element of the Saw movies that I think people responded to seeing that. Um, and then I think also the idea that this guy had a terminal illness and was trying to teach people, it, it gave him another shade or another something to grab onto. That at least, you know, going by, the tweets that I get from Saw fans. Yeah. That's something they really love about, about Jigsaw is the fact that he is not this monster in the Freddy sense of the word. He's a, a guy who was diagnosed with a terminal illness and has kind of lost his mind and become this crazed serial killer. That, that seems to be something people respond to. What's it like, I've always wondered this, when somebody creates something kind of from small origins and then it just explodes like this because I went to horror nights and there was like an insidious maze and there's a jigsaw maze and like mm -hmm. there's a jigsaw roller coaster and and you know t-shirts and like I, I've always wondered what is that experience like you know especially when you're writing the short and then the original saw and then insidious also you know a low budget movie not certainly like oh this is gonna be a maze one day but what's it like to see something that you wrote and then 10 15 years later it's like mm. a brand it's a product it's 
it's got to be strange. It, it is strange. I mean, it's it's really humbling and great. You know, there, there are, I had a moment just at this at this Halloween Horror Nights that they do at Universal Studios. I was there just this past Halloween, and I had this moment actually when I was leaving. We had been through all the mazes, and they had this huge sign up that listed all the different mazes, and so. Um, each label was in the font of the movie. So you had the Evil Dead was in the Evil Dead font. And I was looking at Saw and Insidious and I just had this real, really palpable moment. You don't get them all the time. It's almost like you're gifted them by the universe where you had this kind of out of body experience of like, wow, two films that I wrote, two little films, low budget movies are now uh, this experience. And it was, I, I just felt it was really humbling and I was so grateful, kind of like, it was almost like a happy tears moment. Like I was like, wow, that, that's amazing. Um, the, the strangeness of it comes from the fact that it feels like it almost doesn't belong to you anymore, especially with the Saw movies. Like the last one I wrote was the third one. And I remember sometime around the sixth Saw film, I remember driving down the street in LA and seeing this huge billboard for the latest movie. And it was a strange experience because I'm like, wow, that's something that I created. I was still living with my parents when I wrote that film, and now it's a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. So th that, that's the strange part about it. Not, not saying it's strange in a bad way, yeah. but definitely feels like it belongs to somebody else now, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know, yeah. hear what I'm saying? So do you feel invested at all when you see sort of Jigsaw or like actually the last movie that came out? <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I feel I feel like the creator of it. Like I guess maybe it's a similar feeling that someone like uh, you know Wes Craven had when he would see Freddy related mm -hmm. things. You, you feel like the original author, um, but now that thing that you authored has gone off and gone its own way. And so yeah, I I I, I guess I don't feel directly responsible for it. Like if somebody comes up to me and says. I saw that latest Jigsaw movie. Well, I didn't really have anything to do with that movie. I didn't write it and I wasn't there on the set. I just created this character. So it's kind of a, there's a separation there. That's like, okay, great. Yeah, cool. That's, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting experience. We do have a question in the chat, which is going to bring a few things kind of full circle. Mm -hmm. So what, so Bob, I don't know if you know the legend, the lore about Bob. Bob from Twin Peaks. Bob from Twin Peaks. That he was a grip. That he was a, that he was <laughs> an actual grip. <laughs> or he worked on the like set. Like a set designer. A set designer who, who was. He accidentally got into the shot and they yeah. said, oh, we're going to have to do that again. And David Lynch was like, no. No. Keep it. I usually do a pretty good David Lynch impression. I, oh, do My God. No, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to this question, which maybe the David Lynch will be the answer to it, but maybe not. Jonathan asked, which working director right now would you love to direct a horror film? Well, I would probably say David Lynch. I, uh, I would love to see him direct something that was like really leaned into the horror stuff. Now, I don't think he would ever do that because I... I get the feeling that he doesn't want to classify his films in any particular genre. He just wants to make these dreamlike movies. But wouldn't that be great to see him make something that really leaned into the scariness? Even if you were just like, it's fine, David, you don't have to call it a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I think if he just went full tilt on that, um, that would be great to see. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, for this film, I'm just curious with you and Lynn again, because I just love the fact that she has a franchise. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if she had had a completely different theory about the backstory, or if you guys had talked about it um, in previous films and integrated what you had talked about in no, Alaska. well, we did talk about this once recently, but she had her own backstory that she'd written for the first movie because mm -hmm. she, as an actress, she always does that. She always um, wants to figure out what her character's backstory is. And she told me that the backstory I had figured out for this Insidious film was completely different. Um, so, yeah, well, I couldn't say much, yeah. but sorry, Lynn. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but she did like where we took it with this film. Well, we don't want to say too much about this because we don't want to spoil mm. anything, but it has a pretty cool villain as well um, that taps into 
one of my greatest fears is all I will say. So <clears throat> hopefully it'll tap into yours as well when it opens mm -hmm. this Friday on January 5th. Thank you so much, Mr. Dan Merle. Oh, me? Yes. No, yeah. thank you. Kidding. <laughs> this, is the, this is the most fun I've how, had with a hangover. How, how rude would it have been if I thanked Dan for being here? Not yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, you could just say thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Is we'll there anyone else we need to thank? Um, I want to thank, thank my mother, Universal. I want to thank Universal. our crew. The set I design is good. Yeah. Can we just sort of I know that it's a bad rule of TV to turn your back Let's to the do audience, it. but I'm seeing a lot of cool props here. Like, if I can just, you know, I mean... I'll narrate for you. Can, can, does each guest get to take something home? Is that a rule? That's not guess? typically a rule. No, what would you like to take home? Yeah. It won't be missed. Lee's asking really? if he can take something well, from I mean, our set. You know what? If I... Really, it's the flex capacitor, oh. but I don't want to... I know that you guys would never let me, and I wouldn't want to be that cruel to <laughs> So maybe the Mogwai. You want to take Gizmo? Maybe. You, well, that, Gizmo. you can take Gizmo. Can you just, you just yeah, want just the entire wall. The whole wall. Yeah. Have you seen this can you Easter egg? This would be better if it talked. If it <laughs> yes. I know. And I asked for us to install a PA back there um, just to talk to me in general, but they said the voices in your head are just going to have to do I it. I just love that movie computers <laughs> in sci-fi movies of, uh, of decades past are always like, <laughs> it's clear that the actor was just like, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, like, Careful, that's how we run the show. We yeah, run the show yeah, from yeah, that. Exactly. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm really breaking the fourth wall. I'm not sure where I'm going to be any given second. you got the Predator and Alien over here. Yeah. I mean, you really, you know, this... Uh, this your set is basically the bedroom I wanted as a fifteen-year-old. Me too. That's why I created it like this. We did our research, Lee. <laughs> yeah, this is totally wouldn't let me. anyway. I'm gonna, you know, really get back to the think. I, the I designated <laughs> frame here. So this is my. I'm very excited about your response to our set um, because it is a little piece of our wild imaginations. Um, but I think one of my we had Sofia Coppola in here, and she, oh really? And this is what she sat down and she goes. This is crazy. I feel like I'm in Tokyo. And I'm like, well, wait till you see the puppets we have prepared, Sophia. <laughs> the puppets? Yeah. She got puppets? No. 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 <laughs> no one really gets puppets. One day, I've asked for puppets a lot. And maybe you... if you put in a plug for me, I'll actually get puppets. OK. Well, so what do you want me to say? Address Give me a script. Billy. <laughs> Billy. Mm -hmm. And the... what, what's my script? The... What am I? Okay. But put it in your own way. Is there anyone you, am I particularly talking to? Billy. Okay. You want me to say Billy? <laughs> yeah. Billy, listen. It's pretty lacking that there's no puppets here. This is a, <laughs> this is a puppet free zone. Um, leaving out the fact that that's kind of discriminatory, <laughs> it seems a bit puppist, puppetist <laughs> to me to not do that given that you have other <laughs> sort of props. I think that puppets would, I mean, if we look at the history of puppet shows, the Muppets, um, Sesame Street, Sesame Street um, that one English show that terrified me as a kid. I mean, they're all great shows. I feel like the addition of puppets could really bring this show to a level that it's not quite at yet. I mean, it's great, but it could be <laughs> excellent. And then once it gets to excellent, it could be puppetus. Puppetus. <laughs> are, are we wrapping up? Yeah. No, no. I want to keep talking about puppets. I love Thank we you. just went off the rails right at the end. Yeah, yeah. right at the yeah. end. Yeah. That's, that's our show, wow. ladies and gentlemen. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you for you. going there with me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Go see Insidious, yeah. The Last Key, Go and see this it. Friday, January 5th, in theaters, and watch it like Dan does. You want to show them? Yes. Just like that. Thank you so much what for joining us today. What was he called? Stephen Hawking. Yes. Someone kind of... else called it that. Mm -hmm. I hold my ears and, and then I kind I of... It. Yeah. Not very PC. No. <laughs> Not very Damn politically it. correct. Why did you bring it back You know up? the way to make it more PC? <laughs> yeah is to make the show a different form of PC. Puppet-centric. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> puppets, 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 puppets. Well, puppets for you tomorrow. Thank you for joining Please, us today. Please, yes. Bye.